Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Today we're speaking with Jesse Sheehan, Andrew Bennett, and Brittany Pei. These three extraordinary humans are all part of our Skill Corps community, having traveled with us on volunteer trips to our partner sites in various countries. So I'd like to start with a brief background of how you got started working with the autistic population, and also if you could mention what you're currently up to with regards to employment in the field. Um, Brittany, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so I kind of stumbled into this field, not really, uh, you know, I never really had a direction um, or an intention for it. Um, but I was a college field hockey coach, and then I moved to Virginia um, and was trying to find things along my graduate degree, which was inclusive education, um, and kept coming across job descriptions with behavior analysis in it. Um, and I'd never heard of that before. So I did some research and thought it was such a cool field. Um, so I enrolled in coursework and went through all the process to become a BCBA. Um, so I became certified in 2013, I believe. Um, and then one of my teammates from college actually was in the same path. And she traveled, I think on the very first trip with Molly to Kenya um, tried to convince me to go. I was not in the right point in my life to go on such a journey. Um, so I put it off for a couple years and then joined Skill Corps in 2015. Um, and I haven't left. So, um, so yeah. I, yeah. Uh, so I've led, um, I think eight or eight or nine trips for global autism. Um, I currently work with the early intervention uh, children up in Philadelphia, um, and I'm also uh, involved in behavior analysis in the field of dog training. So that's kind of where Great. I am right now. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting to hear how behavior analysis can be used with different populations like dogs, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you. You literally have the same conversation with human parents as you do with dog parents. It's it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, um, Andrew, how about you? So at the University of Houston Clear Lake here in Houston, Texas, I was going through the Bachelor of Psychology program, and I began to take a couple of basic ABA classes. But I found that the principles of behavior analysis were very useful in what I was doing at the time. I was a martial arts instructor at a local uh, studio. And after the semester was over, I actually was recommended to join a, a research study on campus. It eventually became a, a published paper in uh, Java um, cool. a few years ago. So it was called Adults with Autism as Behavior Technicians for Children with Autism. And mm -hmm. I performed so well in that study that I got referred to a local clinic um, where I worked for four years. And then I didn't really know what I was getting into when I joined the, the behavior analysis field, but I found that I was naturally good at it in a lot of different respects. This was a path-breaking paper that was, I think is going to have long-reaching impacts in the field. I then left my clinic job in summer of 2018 to pursue a different path as the assistant manager to a BCBA for a grant-funded training program called ABA Academy for Problem Behavior. And this teaches public school teachers how to manage problem behavior using um, function-based interventions and functional behavior assessments. Mm -hmm. I'm also, as part of the Lone Star Lend Fellowship at the UT Health in Houston, um, one of the four facilitators in a support group for adults with developmental disabilities. We call it Sphere of Safety, and we're teaching them about some very serious interpersonal issues such as bullying, sexual assault, and abuse, and how to manage those and how to cope and how to find community when they're dealing with these things. Yeah, that's really important, just feeling like they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so I just want to mention that, Andrew, you are a self-advocate. Mm -hmm. And do you mind telling us a little bit about your diagnosis? How old were you and what it was like for you growing up? At the age of three and a half or so, I was diagnosed with at the time was newly coined Asperger's. But 
nowadays it's all on the autism spectrum. So that's what I identify with is nowadays. Um, growing up in elementary school, um, life was good. I was at an elementary school where teachers were supportive. I was gradually mainstreamed in general education. Um, things that got to be a lot more difficult for me in the middle and high school. And I took some years off and then worked into the college, joined community college, and teachers there were extremely supportive. And then I became a student at University of Houston Clear Lake. And then I've had so much support from the uh, ABA community as well in at, at Clear Lake. So I feel that I am really blessed to be a part of this field because it's really given me a new understanding of myself as well as um, given me a job and a career to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure the field is also benefiting from having your insights yeah. in it also. That's why I love being a part of this organization. Um, this being part of skill core and global autism project has truly transformed my perspective and given me a sense that, um, even though I'm different, I'm very valuable to people. And the fact that everybody cares so much is life affirming. So, Yeah. We'll get more into that later about mm-hmm. how Skill Corps has kind of transformed your life. So thanks. And Jesse, how about you? What's your background and how'd you get started in this field? Um, I was kind of similar to Brittany where I kind of stumbled into it and not intentionally looking to work in autism specifically, um, I knew I wanted to work with kids. And after graduating, um, then there were roles that kind of at a clinic in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm originally from, um, and got hired there, not really knowing much about autism. Um, so just kind of jumped into it and loved it. Um, so I was a therapist in homes and in schools with students who had their aid support provided um, typically through their family's insurance kind of like years ago. I think it's much different now. Um, I'm not sure. It's yeah. And then I worked, I moved to Cleveland and continued, but was in a center-based program um, and then ended up going back to grad school um, to try to figure out what I wanted to do more as a long-term career I think it was before I was really aware that like becoming a BCBA and like staying within the field was even an option. I'm like, not sure why. I don't know if it was just earlier days um, or not knowing where to look, but went to school to become a school psychologist. And so that's what I'm doing now. Um, And I, it's interesting to try to use a lot of like my behavior background in to applying it, working with um, lots of different kids within the the public school setting. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, behavior analysis can be applied to everyone in their everyday lives, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's wonderful to have a community of professionals from various backgrounds all across the country, pretty much, and come together with uh, this spirit of a common mission, which is you know, to spread acceptance and awareness of autism all over the world. So I want to ask you guys how you heard about the Global Autism Project and Skill Core, how you first started to get involved. Andrew, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I can. I've actually been getting uh, emails from GET for a couple of years and never really looked too much into it. I wasn't sure what it was or how famous. So I didn't really know anything about it. I never looked into it more deeply. But then in October of 2018, I randomly happened upon one of the sponsored ads that was all over Facebook. And at that time, I was in a very bleak and dark place personally. And one of the things people do when they're in that stage of life, lost, they're down on themselves, they don't know who or what they are. They try something new and exciting to get them in touch with their strengths and their passions. And I knew that I was passionate about uh, traveling and helping using ABA in different contexts, as well as I just recently started using ABA internationally with the UHCL's Telehealth World ABA project. Um, So I said, what the heck? Anything's better than where I'm at right now. I'm going to try this out. 
I forced myself to apply in two days before anyone could talk me out of it because I knew <laughs> my family was going to talk me out of it. And I just went ahead and applied. And I thought, you know, this would be a great way for me to get out there, travel again, um, build upon the skills that I learned last time I went to uh, went abroad and help turn around 2018 because it was such a complicated resoundingly emotional year for me. And I wanted to relive that uh, positive experience in the summer of 2018 and give it some purpose and meaning. So I wanted to just get out there and try something different. And I, I'm so glad that I did. Mm -hmm. And where did you go that first trip? Um, Czech Republic. Very cool. Yeah. They're doing great things at that center. They have a social skills group that they're organizing for early learners and um, doing a lot of parent training now. They're expanding yeah. their staff. So That's great because I haven't really heard what they were doing uh, recently in October, but I still mm -hmm. talk to the owners a lot. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you did a presentation while you were there too, right? Yes. Um, the presentation was is called A World Without Borders. And I oh. got this idea from the motto of a gap. Um, when I actually reached out on, and I was commenting a lot on the posts that ABA Centrum was making, and I told them a little bit of my life story. And Katarzyna, the lead therapist of the clinic, says, hey, you know what? We would really love it if when you're here, you could give a lecture to our parents and our staff about your life on the spectrum. And we hope that it can be an inspiration to them and give us some give us something to show the world that in this country where autism is still pretty unknown. So I worked on that for the next uh, few months and I gave that um, on July 30th well, during my visit. And the theme of it was there are different stages of autism awareness as we know it. Um, mm -hmm. You start with knowledge of what it is, but then you go to understanding more about what autism is, what makes it different. And then you get to a point where you're aware, where you are actively trying to make the world better for them. But then this ultimately leads them to acceptance and the world of acceptance, which is the highest grade of, as we call it, autism awareness. And when we get to that point, we have a world that's where autism isn't a border between people, where language isn't a border between people, which was also a personal theme for me since I'm an aspiring multilingual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was going to ask, because you were able to use your language skills to communicate in Prague, right? Yes. I uh, learned French when I went to France. After, after five months of study, I was able to go over there and speak comfortably in French to the locals. I, I studied Spanish four years in high school, but I haven't really used it as much, even though I live in Texas. <laughs> but then when I uh, got to the Czech Republic trip, I'm like... What the heck? I'm going to do this again. <laughs> I'm going to pick up Czech from scratch. I don't speak a word of it. I don't know anything really about the culture, even though I live in Texas where there's a lot of Czech people. So I started to study the language, started to reach out to the local community in Houston, and started to write in Czech all the time on Facebook. And then I even made a friend in uh, Prague who helped me to learn. She's an author whose name is Milada Spideska. Incredible. I'm just telling her I hope she's listening. Cool, yeah. <laughs> we'll make sure this reaches her. Of course. I was in ultimately the first uh, traveler to Prague who learned the language, and it helped a lot in a couple of respects because the owners don't speak English, and we met a couple people that didn't. So right. I still uh, treasure that. Um, yeah. connection to the Czech Republic and still something I'm really proud of. Mm -hmm. But yeah. being, having that be part of my journey where I was, where I had, I was like a bridge between their culture and mine and ours, as well as the community, the autism community and the general public made this talk so meaningful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyways. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Ahead. Um, Brittany, you said you've, you've led like seven, eight trips. Have yeah. you lost count? <laughs> I have actually. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's eight. I think, um, February, I think was supposed to be nine. 
Um, yep. So hopefully October will be nine and February of next year will be 10. So, mm-hmm. Have you been to all the sites? I haven't been to all the sites. I've been to some sites twice, um, but they keep adding them. So I have to keep going. To keep yeah. <laughs> so, one yeah. day I hope to be at all the sites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I must say, Brittany, you're, you're, somewhat of a celebrity within the organization. And people are like, have you met Brittany? Did you know, did you travel with her? Cause you've just been um, so involved over the years. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I, I think as you guys, you know, as Andrew, you, you most recently traveled in 2018, you know, I think when you really believe in what, what is happening and, and the way that the organization works, it's hard not to come back, you know? And mm-hmm. um, I think the, the thing that really got me, um, I, I, my second trip was to Kenya and then my third trip was to Kenya and just, and they were relatively close together and just seeing all the things we worked on the first time was in in Kenya and actually the progress and the success that the staff had made with concepts that we talked about and they learned and they implemented. That was probably one of the most powerful things I've experienced. Um, and I think that really hooked me. I was like, okay, let's keep going because clearly this is having an impact that that we intended. And um, so that was that was really cool. And yeah, I think that happens, you know, across the sites. You, know, you just sometimes you just don't get to see it if you don't return or you 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 know travel once and and then don't come back. That's a really good point. And you build these relationships with the staff too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yep. Jesse, what about you? How did you first hear about Skill Corps and where have you traveled to? Um, I, when I was, we were actually at work in Cleveland and kind of feeling that like wanting to do something different and feeling kind of stuck, I think, um, a friend and I, and I think we put into just Google like travel, autism, just to <laughs> see if anything existed. Um, and I had a similar experience to Andrew where I waited. So we, we searched and it showed up and she was, my friend, um, was kind of reading the website to me and it seemed like kind of made up or too good to be true. Yeah, it, I know. Something, like matched like two really strong interests for me. Um, and I kind of just put it out of my mind as just like, Oh, that sounds incredible. But, but you know, like sort of just let it go. Um, and I think a year or so later, it, I just sort of thought about it again and um, kind of similar to just applied before I could think to not apply. Um, and it just went from there. So, and I actually had to delay my first trip because I was in grad school and I couldn't make the timing work. So it was this really long process for me to, to do my first trip. Um, but I went to, I think it was in July of 2016, um, traveled to Chandigarh in India and, um, and with timing and things, it's been almost like once a year I've been able to be involved again. Um, and every time it comes at the perfect timing where it's, you know, it's just inspiring and invigorating. Um, and it always seems to match up with like when I really need it. Um, so it's just been incredible. And I'm like so grateful to have it in my life. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I first heard about the project because a coworker of mine was fundraising for her trip in February 2018. She was going to Chandigarh also, to Sorum. <laughs> so shout out to Gianna Licio if you're listening. Um, yeah, it's funny. I opened up my email and I was like, what? This is so cool. I confuse traveling with working with kids. Where do I sign up? And just immediately didn't turn back pretty much. So I ended up going to Uganda that summer. I was supposed to go to Nigeria, but... There was political unrest going on at the time in Abuja, so we had to just reroute ourselves, but still had an amazing experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to get into kind of the meat of the, the training a little bit so people can have an idea of what happens on the ground. Uh, Brittany, could you provide a description of the training model that you follow or that we all follow during the volunteer trips? Yeah, sure. So this is, um, you know, something that I think um, people outside of the organization aren't really as aware of. You know, they they think that, oh, it's great you get to go to these other countries and 
work with kids in need there. Um, but really what we look to do is help to build conceptual understanding for the staff so that when we leave, um, they have a handle on those concepts and they can implement them as needed in whatever way makes sense culturally in their centers. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the big focus that we have. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Every site is different and where they are in their understanding of ABA and how to apply it to the kids and the resources that they have and the number of staff that they have is different. So, um, that's, you know, definitely considered. Um, so when we go over there, we kind of have an idea of some of the concepts that we're going to work on. But when you get there, you make sure that it actually matches with what the staff are interested in learning. Um, and you might find that you have some things that you both agree on and some things that you don't agree on, or maybe are not going to be the center of, of learning on that trip. Um, but the biggest thing is that you make sure that whatever concept you do land on is important to that site. Otherwise, you can teach something and they can understand it. But if they're not going to implement it, then, you know, you haven't really touched on what you need to be doing for that trip. Um, so again, each site is a little bit different. Sometimes you lead a big presentation, like a PowerPoint. Um, sometimes it might just be more of like a round table conversation to generate ideas. Um, you know, I've had had sites that I've gone to where they really want the PowerPoint presentation. That seems to be their way of learning that they're comfortable with. And then the following days, you look to support their skills in sessions directly. So, um, you know, you ask them or point out how they can implement some of the things that you've been teaching to them. Um, other sites, you know, they might have a really good handle on concepts, but just be a little uncomfortable in implementing them. So you're almost there to kind of encourage them to try out these ideas and, and kind of press them to um, discuss it as a group among their staff to continue to kind of drive uh, different thoughts and ideas. And um, I was most recently in Nigeria and they were very concerned about their data sheets and, you know, there's these set structured data sheets and I want it. I feel like it would help if we did, we did it this way. And I think this should be on it. And, um, really it was just us saying like, well, do those things. You can make a data sheet. And they were like, Oh, we can make a data sheet, you know, yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, you, yeah. you, just as we do here in the States with our kids, you really individualize based on what the center needs. Um, always keeping in mind that the way that they implement things has, you know, kind of a, you remember the cultural framework and ensure that you're working within that. Right. Exactly. And I'm glad you brought up the data sheets thing because that has happened in the past where people, our partners are like, uh, just give it to me. Don't you have something already? I, can't you just print something out or share something with me? But this whole idea of do with, not for, so mm -hmm. that we can give them the skills and they can know how to create other data sheets in the future. Like, what good is it if we just hand them something that was made for our benefit? Right. Um, yeah. And also this, uh, I like how you said, asking them what they think is important. You know, we have this Venn diagram that we reference a lot where it's, you know, what is essential to us for, for training and what is, sorry, what is preferable to us, what is essential for them and in that middle ground, you have what's, what is sustainability, right? And that's really what's going to last. Um, Jesse, do you mind um, talking a little bit about our approach using Socratic questioning? I'll give it my best shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's kind of along the lines of the doing with, not for. And when you're having those trainings or discussions, instead of just coming in as in the mode of like, I'm the expert, I'm here to tell you everything I know, um, setting it up as much more of a conversation and asking questions that help expand our partners thinking and reasoning. Um, and it's something that like a lot of this applies, you know, you can use it in so many aspects of like your just regular life too, but to really, it kind of takes the problem solving 
method that we've been trained to do that sometimes like we've internalized at this point. Um, and it makes it a conversation to help our partners kind of process their questions and be able to almost get to their own answer um, through that conversation instead of it just being a question that they ask and we just give them what we know. Yep. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. And um, yeah, also kind of fostering that critical thinking skill in them too. Uh, It's a great way to assess what they already know by asking them uh, how they would maybe handle a situation or what they've tried in the past. Sometimes, um, oh, mm-hmm. sorry. I Go think ahead. it's just even providing the opportunity um, for a lot of our partners to have that conversation with another professional because I've been in a lot of conversations where the partner sites and the partner staff, like they know the answer almost. Like they might need a little feedback to get there, but they're on the right path. And it's just that ability to pair with you know, another professional with some more different experiences to kind of validate their thinking. And it's, right. you know, you see that connection made and it's really impactful. Mm-hmm. I think another thing the Socratic questioning and method does too, um, is it really just gives them ownership of the idea and then that helps them yep. put it into existence. You know, I think sometimes if somebody just tells you an answer, you can, you know, re- responding, you can just kind of go with that, but you're not able to apply it. But if you help them come up with it, they feel pretty empowered and um, it's more, I think it sticks better in their brain. You know, they're going to pull from that at a later date. Yep. And it leads to being able to apply it to the next time mm-hmm. something comes up and be like, oh, we talked through this. Like I can now do that like with my partner in country or on my own to, to try to solve my own problems and not be stuck just because you're given that answer for that one situation one time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Andrew, do you have anything to add? I have a few things to say about sustainability also, the yeah. other part of the training model. It's drawn from one of the cornerstones of ABA as a field, a social validity. With the things that we choose for interventions have to be relevant and applicable to the social context or they're not going to be effective. So like materials and teaching should be in perhaps the client's preferred language in the mode of, mode of modality of communication that they're able to use, uh, reflective of certain social customs, like certain ways of greetings or social gestures that may not be appropriate in different cultures. So one time we actually were, I remember working with a client who was in a Hispanic culture where it was a lot more appropriate to hug people than it is, than it is in the more mainstream American culture. So we had the we would have to delineate with them, like, it's okay to hug your family members, but, like, not with everybody else randomly that you meet on the street, and, or even just your friends, maybe. Um, so, I mean, that's an area of discrimination, like, you'd be normally working with, but it gets more complicated when you have to deal with a cultural factor like that. And right. as far as it applied to the partner site that I was at, um, in the Czech Republic, there isn't a very wide presence or understanding of autism as it is. There's a lot of, there's a lack of general government support. And we have to start with making sure that people are aware that there is a need for services, that there's a need for treatment out there in the first place. It doesn't matter how good your staff is or how much they work, how well they work with the parents. If nobody's going to fund it, this isn't going to work. So that's why one of the goals at the center was social media, marketing, um, getting the word out. And that's also where I came in, was to raise some awareness of what autism exactly is and what GAP does out there. Um, Because you have to start with the very basics, creating a need, a motivation for there to be support for the services in the first place, or you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, that's a very good point. A lot of our partners struggle with outreach in the community and marketing in general. So, yeah. Um, You know, and so much of our work involves respecting the culture that we're stepping into, right? Just as you guys are saying. So what does cultural humility mean to you and how do you practice it? Um, So one of the things that I've kind of uh, thought about in the last bit of time, um, 
you know, here in Philadelphia, we have a lot of families that, that are from a variety of cultures. And um, after every staff meeting, we have kind of a case study and um, it's where somebody talks about some of the struggles they're having. And most recently, somebody brought up that um, they are having this family that really wants their child to talk. The child has no signs of speech or, you know, make, not making sounds. Um, and the, the staff is kind of pushing PACS or an AAC device. And um, and everybody was kind of asking, like, what assessments have been done? What, you know, this or that? And um, just from my experience with global autism, I was like, is this family from a different culture? And they were like, yes. I said, okay, um, have you thought about any aspect of that culture that, you know, maybe PACS or an AAC device might actually be more aversive to them, um, you know, or, or why maybe they're resistant to those things. And that opened up a much bigger conversation, um, talking about like how to kind of ease into that. But what it got me thinking about was that, you know, everybody says be culturally mindful, but I feel like sometimes here in the States, what that means is identify that it's from a different culture, but you're still imparting your cultural norms on them. Um, instead of saying, okay, I identify that you're from a different culture and now that means I have to understand, I have to step in your shoes and look at it from your perspective and not force my cultural norms on you, but really work around what is, what your culture says. And, you know, maybe the end result, we'd love to get PEC started for this child, but we're not going to go there right away. You know, how do we take our baby steps? How do I have conversations with you about what the benefits are and, and listen to your conversation about your concerns or what that means, you know, to people in your culture? Um, so I think a lot of that, you know, I think global autism does a good job. You know, you're taking people from the States pretty much and putting them in another culture. And that kind of shifts the understanding. You know, you're going to somebody else's country and you have to follow those norms. But here in the States, we're almost assuming that just because they're in the States, they should follow our cultural norms. And I think when we start to kind of twist that, there should be a better understanding and a better working relationship between what we're trying to accomplish and what they're willing to do. Cool. Yep. Jesse, do you have something to add about cultural humility? It was, I like kind of got stumped thinking about this one um, because I think like Brittany said, like when you're going into these other countries, I've, I've just had the experience where it's just so exciting and different and mind opening um, that I've been excited to kind of take it all in. And it feels so different that I've, it just seems strange to think like, why would I think I'm so different in this setting? Like, why would what I think be the first thing that these people are thinking. Um, just that, I don't know, like each step of the way, like I think going in and being excited to learn from our partners and to take in what they know and value um, and then be able to share from that space. And like, it, I don't know, it seems almost like hard to think about doing it another way when you're in it. I think in at home, I think it does seem like an easier thing to have happen where we might feel like we're the more dominant culture, like people should assimilate, um, I guess, but in, in country, uh, I've just always been so excited and it's just all, I don't know. It's so rich and there's so many neat differences, um, in each partner site that I just feel like being willing to kind of embrace that and to ask a lot of questions, um, and not make any assumptions when you're in a new place, um, really can go a long way. Right. Yeah. We're, it's a two way street, right? We're, it's an exchange really. They're maybe learning some clinical stuff from us, but we're taking in their culture and just embracing it really. Andrew, do you have something to add? Um, I mean, I've, talked a lot about how I practiced uh, cultural uh, humility um, in the sense that I tried to assimilate their culture as thoroughly as I possibly could. Yeah, like but learning their I, language. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I learned how to cook all the 
food from the country as well. So I knew a lot about um, what to expect when I was there. I researched the city, so I knew where to go. So it helped a lot for us as a team. But really what I wanted to cover with this question was what impact it had on the partners. Um, they could really see that I'd made a lot of effort and it also inspired a lot of the other team members to start asking questions, becoming more curious. It was also helpful because even though nobody else had learned the language, they were able to get more confident with using Google Translate to step out and use that to communicate with, um, our partners who were not English speaking. Because historically, we hadn't really done that. We'd done translation through people who spoke English. But I think that that effort sparked a lot more effort, a lot of effort from everybody else. And they were, so we were hoping that that would mean that uh, Katrin and Martin were going to feel a lot more included in the decision-making process rather than have a go-between all of the time. And it seemed at the end of our trip like we'd accomplished that objective. So I think that if you are the one that makes the first step towards another culture, they're the ones that are going to come back to you in return and really um, show their generosity, what they're about, and they'll be more willing to work with you. We actually did a few days of pairing before we really started working directly with them. And I think that's important to ensure a good communication is and mutual respect is established before you really start getting into the meat of things. Yeah, it's pairing is so important. I mean, we wouldn't go into a child's home and just immediately start running programs with them without pairing. It's the same thing when we go to a partner site or a new country. And, you know, culture just doesn't, lim- isn't just limited to other countries, right? Like a culture could be in someone's home, even within the same country, or a culture is with, between a group of friends or in a workplace. And, you know, I think you guys touched on a lot of great points, like just being open and curious and non-judgmental and not coming from this place of dominance, like you were saying, and also being vulnerable too and honest that you don't know everything, right? Like there's that, what you know, what you don't know, and what you don't know that you don't know. (laughs) So so much more. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you... (laughs) So. <laughs> yeah, and if you kind of open yourself up to being vulnerable in front of them, in front of whoever it is you're trying to have that connection with, they can feel it from you and it's mirrored. You know, they feel like they're in a safe place and that they can learn from you too. I so. think as you were saying that, it made me, like everything also applies to the team you're traveling with. Mm-hmm. Like we're, you know, maybe someone's coming from Canada, but a lot of us are traveling from the U.S. where I think we go into it thinking that maybe we're all, you just, I don't know. Like if you go in assuming that you share the same culture with these strangers you're meeting for the first time to now go spend two weeks together, you know, you can really hit some roadblocks. So I think all of those same, like taking that perspective and when it gets applied within the team itself, it makes the team richer and then yep. better able for the team to then t- do that with these mm-hmm. people at the partner site. It's just, there's so many layers of needing to be open and willing to be vulnerable and ask questions of the people you're around just as soon as you land in Brooklyn, you know, let alone <laughs> you take these like really long flights across the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had a Canadian on our team too. And that definitely helped spark the intercultural dialogue. <laughs> it's like you have Tim Hortons and we don't. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Going on a two week trip with complete strangers to a foreign country can really push you out of your comfort zones. Right. So, you know, people come back saying their lives have been transformed from this experience. You said that earlier, Andrew. So, you know, I wanted to touch on how you guys have grown personally and professionally from this. So maybe we could start about or start with what you've learned about yourself from doing these trips. Brittany, do you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think back to who I was when I first traveled. Um, I had imposter syndrome for sure. And I was very afraid to speak, very afraid to make a decision of any sort. Um, and I had, I had a, 
a wonderful team that really just kind of embraced me and encouraged me and supported me. And, um, you know, after I saw what was happening, I knew I wanted to continue to be a part of it. And that kind of started to shift things inside of me. And, um, I knew that if I wanted to leave trips, I was going to have to be a little bit more confident, a little bit more assertive, a little bit more, um, you know, outgoing in terms of interacting with people. Um, I grew up in a very small town where everybody knew everybody. So (laughs) putting myself in a position where you're surrounded by people you don't know for three weeks and like, you've got to form relationships. Um, And I've seen that kind of come out in me in the years since where I, I mean, I, this is crazy, but I, um, I moved from upstate New York to Virginia and I was so uncomfortable that I didn't leave my house by myself for weeks. So, uh, that, and then now like I just go to New York randomly and take strangers <laughs> to different countries I've never been to for three weeks. And <laughs> um, so it, it really, I think like it empowered me to, um, you know, I always say like, there's always a solution. There's always a solution. And so you might face problems and that's just the reality of life, but you're always going to find a solution. Um, and I think that, you know, everything about Global Autism Project, sometimes I feel almost selfish because I think it does so much for me personally. Um you know, that it's like, you know, people are like, wow, this is so cool that you do this. And I'm like, oh, but I, I mean, I feel like it does so much for me. So like, <laughs> you know, give and take there. But um, yeah, I've, I've become a completely different person, completely mm-hmm. different person. Um, professionally, I think I'm uh, a little bit mm-hmm. more, um, you know, inquisitive. I ask questions. I really want to understand what's happening. Um, making sure that it's the right decision across the board, not just because somebody higher up says to do it. Um, I also think it's, it's helped me understand how to interact and relate to people in a better way. So Mm -hmm. I think any time I've had staff that I've been supporting, um, I feel like our relationships are better because I, I am, I feel okay saying, I don't really know a lot about that part of ADA, but we can find an answer. There's going to be an article. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that helps people that travel with skill core, you know, a lot of people come in thinking that they're supposed to know everything, especially if they have those four letters for whatever reason, (laughs) but the reality of the situation is nobody can possibly know everything about everything. And that's the beauty is that now you have a network of hundreds of people that you can ask, for anything, a couch to sleep on, an article or support with a research project. Like you literally have hundreds of people that are there for you, um, Mm -hmm. because of global autism. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's taught me so much about the world in general and just, you know, different, you, your, my favorite quote is, you know, um, a mind stretched by new experiences can never go back to its original dimensions. And I think that that just, really is global autism. Every aspect of this organization changes you in some way. Um, You might see it immediately and you might see it, you know, months from when you return, but no doubt it has an effect. Right. That is so true. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be months later and you're like, oh yeah, that thing that happened then is affecting how I'm responding to this right now. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, how about you? What, how have you changed? Um, I, in addition to the amount of effort it took to fundraise when I had never done a thing like that in my life, I harnessed all my resources I possibly could. I pushed through a tremendous amount of obstacles and fears that I had for going out and asking people for money and a support. And it gave me a, a mission to call my own. And I learned to persevere through a whole lot of no's and rejections and I made it to the 5,000 and I learned a lot of ways to get people's support and interest going and it's helped me a lot in any future leadership project that I've undertaken and while I was on the trip I also found like it really made a difference to the to the to the partner site just how much effort I put into the trip and also into the lecture that I gave it really gave me a new start and gave me a boost for 
getting out there, sharing my story and my experiences with the world. It's given me a new original tagline of my own. Mm -hmm. So now where I'm going with this in the future is I'm taking some of the things that I spoke about um, and turning it into, I mean, it could turn into a book someday. Um, Uh, Yeah, for sure. The title of the next talk I want to give at some point is called Autism is a Universal Language. It would not have taken place without Global Autism Project. Mm-hmm. And I, as far as um, working with the rest of the team, it really helped to be to learn how to plan activities together, um, find search around the city for things to do. So it helped a lot for me working with the rest of the group and getting some more experience traveling with groups. And I knew also because I'm the kind of person that's very detail oriented and pushes points to their logical conclusions. Socratic questioning just really stuck with me. And it's something that I've continued to use since. Um, As far as the things that I needed to work on, there was a great deal that I uh, learned about. Um, I was proud of the work that I did to immerse myself in the culture, but I just took it to such an extreme that it was hard for me to compromise with people. It was, I was, I was always interested in all the most check things to do possible. And I was trying to learn more words and trying to converse in the language, even if that meant I had to really focus on that. And it led to me not really focusing as much on team building and working together with everybody as I really probably should have. And so I, really found that I neglected the personal side of myself um, compared to the intellectual um, side that I had developed. And I definitely have made that a priority for my uh, next trip is to concentrate a lot more on making myself a stronger, better person, um, getting more control over good self-care habits, good interpersonal habits, and I definitely learned a lot of lessons about coping with unknowns and unexpected changes, which are just naturally difficult for me, but there's always going to be those sorts of things on trips. And so that's why I want to keep going out and doing more trips to get more used to this. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I came back from the trip, I was like, oh my gosh, there's, I got a lot of work left to do and to grow before I come back. And, but at the end of the month, I really emerged with a lot of, clear understanding about where I need to go in the future. And then not too long after that, some things happened to, in my personal life that really validated that I'd really spent a lot of honest time working on myself. And then I got accepted to go to Leadership Academy, which really gave me a new boost in my motivation to stay involved with Global Autism Project and to believe that like, I'm going to have another chance to do this stronger and better. Mm-hmm. And I and even though the trip didn't go the way I was originally thinking it was going to go, or some things that went according to plan, some things did not, I believe that it went the way it needed to go to get me to the next place in my life and prepare me for the future. And I would not have traded the trip experience for anything. Andrew, I I really appreciate your honesty and your candidness. I can imagine that it it's not easy to talk about these things and to admit the struggles that we all go through. Yeah. You know, yeah. there there are points in those 2 weeks where I'm sure everyone feels a little bit lonely or you yeah. know, has some wishes that something would have gone a different way or whatever their delta yeah. is for that day. It's a big blow to my big ego. So <laughs> uh-huh. I'm, but, I'm glad that that happened. So it's but you, yeah, <laughs> you still, you know, you, you have this perspective about it and that, that you're not, you, you wouldn't change anything that happened because of what you did learn from it. And that's a lot, uh, that shows a lot of maturity and self-awareness. So props to you. Well, I mean, there's things I would change, but I'm glad for where I am now. I'm glad for where I am because of mm-hmm things that I learned or things that didn't go the way I thought they would. So Mm -hmm. cool. But I don't know. I mean, what would happen if we did change the past? We might change where we are now. So 
Right. I can't change the past, but I'm just happy with where I am now. Yeah. And you learn from it and you do something different next time. Yes. <laughs> Jesse, how about you? How have you grown from skill core? Um, I think the biggest thing for me has been like recognizing, cause I think, you know, there's when things are unknown or unfamiliar, like there's, I still feel that like sense of unease a little bit, but I feel so much stronger, um, in myself that like, even though I might feel unsure, like, I don't know what might be coming, knowing kind of like Brittany said, like that there's a solution, like it's going to go, it will f- probably be fine. Um, like one way or the other. And that I have a lot of skills to, to help myself and to help other people. Um, I don't know, just feeling a lot more kind of sure in myself um, and also comfortable with being unsure, um, but knowing that it'll probably be okay. Um, And I think recognizing that, like, like I said, like I feel very like much more settled into myself and what I know, um, which also allows me to then be much more comfortable when I don't know something and like asking other people for help or just being upfront and like, Oh, I don't know that, but mm-hmm. we can probably figure it out. Um, yeah, it just, and it like, I think it just ripples through. Like I said, like, it seems that like each time that I've gotten to be involved and that I've been able to travel again or do leadership training and things like that. Um, it always just like, I feel like I'm like at my best self and like growing when I'm involved. Um, so like every time it just makes me want to like take all those experiences and like keep stretching them into my regular life um, to like try to take that best version that I feel like I am back home, you know, and show up with that version of myself mm-hmm. in regular stuff. Yeah. What, what was it like for you being on the team, having a different background um, than I the rest of them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I show up, like even the first trip, um, because I had moved out of directly working with kids into, I was like, I think I was still a student um, or I might've been in my internship, but I felt like very unsure of, you know, I'm not in the field every day. And I think the first time someone said manding, I was like, well, that's not a word that we talked about. So now I'm out, like, I don't know what we're talking about. And then, you know, as you're working, it's, it has never been a problem and it's always been an asset to be able to, to collaborate. Um, from having different experiences. Um, and sometimes I think for me, like needing it to make sense in a way that like I can understand it, it helps take it out of sometimes that technical realm. Um, so I like, I, I think it's just, it's always been something like I still feel intimidated by it every time because I'm like, well, I'm one step or two steps removed from doing this work every day directly. Um, so it again, like pushes me to be confident, um, to show up anyway, and to like have faith that it'll all like come together. Um, and that I'm not going to not know what I'm talking about. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it allows for like, I think good collaboration, but it, you know, it's, and it's nice to have the differences because then you have people that are RBTs or BCBAs or speech pathologists. Um, and it's just, I think it helps for everybody to feel like everyone has something to offer no one has the best thing to say or is going to be like guaranteed to be the strongest team member or anything. Um, because everybody has something of value that they know and can bring. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Having a a different perspective on the team really just helps a lot. When I was in Uganda, we had a professional photographer traveling with us and she would sometimes sit in on our brainstorming sessions and, We'd turn to her and we'd be like, does this make sense? Because we just need to check with someone who's not in the ABA world. And she's like, uh, actually, can you explain this part a little bit better? Because the staff there at the center had no idea what ABA was. So really running it through the photographer first was our kind of test. Um, I just always picture like in my role um, as a psych, I do a lot where I'm trying to help teachers and parents Mm -hmm. understand where we might be coming from as educators. Um, And I think that translates a lot to taking something from, you know, like American English ABA into a probably a much different culture where even if it's the same language being spoken, it might not directly work. And Mm so I think if, if I can understand it, then our partners might have a better chance. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, if you guys could just describe a moment from one of your trips that surprised, inspired, or moved you. I got one. Andrew, yeah? Yeah. So there were a couple that I thought were particularly moving, um, but the one that I really want to highlight is what we're working for, what we're trying to achieve with this organization is I had a feeling that I talk was going to be a lot of reactions from people and and really hope hopefully give some hope to some struggling parents out there. And I got approached by one of the moms who was like, my child is very frag medically fragile. I don't know what's going to happen to him, you know. And it was hard for her to come forward and share that, but she also sparkled with the hope inside her that like, you know, I treasure every moment with him. I don't know what's going to happen to him. And, but I also, and I also look at his disability and him being on the spectrum as well as a gift as well. He's special, he's unique, he's different. And I wouldn't trade him for anything. And I feel like I formed a really deep connection with somebody that day. And, it highlighted what I've been trying to work towards for the past three and a half months making this. But I think it also highlights what we want to achieve as an organization, what we're fighting for in this time and place right now, why it's important that we are still around fighting for a world without borders for many years to come, that there are people out there that are struggling and still trying to make a better life for their children um, in a world that's not always prepared for it and not always equipped for it, but to see that um, there, are, there, is, there are people all around the world that want the same things that we do, I hope gives us a boost in what we're trying to achieve right now. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Brittany, do you have something to share? Something that surprised, inspired, or moved you? Sure. Um... I mean, I've had, I've had so many wonderful experiences and, um, teams and moments that, uh, it's kind of hard to capture them all. But I think when I think about this question, what comes to mind is kind of that period on every trip where your team, your team's not quite convinced that they know what they're doing and that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And you have this, you know, you're, you're constantly like, I promise like these things, like, we're going to observe, we're going to figure this out. And by the end of week one, you're going to have a lot more comfort in what's going on. Um, and I really love to see that change, that shift in the team where they go from, this is all new experiences and a completely different culture that, you know, they're probably pretty uncomfortable. They've maybe not been eating the same things or having the best sleep for a couple of days. And then it clicks and you, and it brings the team together. It brings the team closer to the center. It brings you, uh, you know, like the presentation or the skills that you're working on, they come out through that. Um, I think that's probably one of my favorite things about skill core. It's just seeing that shift from really being pretty insecure and uncomfortable and not confident about what you're doing or what your role is to, figuring that out and then moving forward with full force and, you know, two weeks, we have two weeks to get this done. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, I I'd have to say that that's just one of the coolest things to see that shift. Right. Yeah. Jesse, how about you? Uh, the thing that every time I think about like what, like an amazing experience, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, from my first trip of when we were in um, um, Amritsar and we got to have, we shared the meal when we were at the Golden Temple. Um, and it's something, it, just an experience that I don't think I would have ever had the opportunity to have in my like, entire life potentially had I not been a part of this team and this organization. Um and it just like, it still kind of like chokes me up because it was so incredible. Um, but we were able to join in with, uh, you know, so it's a, a meal that's provided through the temple and it's um, kind of a tenant of the religion. And even though we were very much other, like there were not a lot of other white people, certainly not another people that are as tall as me, like we stuck mm -hmm. out a lot. Um, 
and everyone still just kind of went with it. And we were able to be welcomed and participate in this thing that um, I think for most of the people there was a big part, like a big momentous time of their life to be there, but at the same time, also very like normal for them to be sharing a meal in this way. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just, I don't, it was incredible. It was like kind of sensory overload, but in the best way. Um, And just something that like, I'll probably not ever do again, um, unless I get to go back to Chandigarh, which would be great. But (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it was just, it still sticks with me as just like, you're just kind of eye opening and incredible and amazing. And not something I would have gotten to do otherwise. Yeah. It sounds like a beautiful experience. Well, you know, I just want to finish with asking you if you have any advice to future travelers with skill core. Jesse, you want to start us off with this one? Sure. I think the hardest thing to do, but which is kind of like when like you're looking for a relationship and everyone tells you like, it'll happen when you're not looking. So this is probably not easy advice to take, but I think, trusting the process, like as difficult as that can be, um, that it hopefully will all work out. We're definitely in a weird time right now. Um, but you know, when we see the other side of that and we're, people are fundraising and we're, you know, you're waiting for your trip or your chance to travel. Um, just trusting that it all is going to work out. And when you're in country that it's, you know, most likely all going to work out. Um, because it typically does. And mm-hmm. then the, out, you know, the outcome of that is amazing. Um, and that it's okay to be unsure, but that even with that uncertainty, like it'll probably be all right. And I wrote down to pack wrinkle release. For <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is the magic potion. Magical thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Andrew, what do you have to say to future travelers? Well, I think that, um, I think obviously it's very important to show respect when you're there to the country, the people, what they do, how they live. And that's the most important thing you do. Probably the worst thing you can do, the quickest way you can turn them off is to disrespect them. So the easiest way to get them on your side is to respect them. And I think that it's not just respecting their culture and where they come from, but treating them just as much like human beings as everyone else. But coupled with that, um, the other side of that is take care of yourself. Be the best person that you can be when you're there. And um, it's the one thing that I wish I'd done the mo- more of when I was there. And to you're, if you don't show up with, your, with 100% of yourself, you're not going to be able to be the p- person that they need. And it's going to be the one thing that will get you through any challenge you face on the trip. I definitely felt like if I didn't get my way, that it really affected me greatly in my ability to perform. And so I think you have to go into it with not really expecting one way or another to for things to turn out in a certain direction. You know, I I believe that in a lot of ways, in a lot of times, a lot of places, everything happens for a reason. You just have to roll with it. That's yeah. where we're at right now as an organization. We're we're dealing with an uncertain future right now. And I also am going through a period of transition right now in my life. And that's why I focused on making this year a year of personal rebuilding and growth and mm-hmm. conquering a lot of conquering a lot of old thing, things that happened to me a long time ago and becoming better moving forward in the 2020s with an open heart and open mind. And really, that's what I would want everybody else to do when they're on a trip is to let every single experience, whether it's good or bad or ugly, (laughs) in some cases, change you for the better. Just trust in the process. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Brittany, final thoughts? Um, Sure. Um, So I would say... I think it's really hard for people a lot of times to come into a you know, a site at a, you know, in a country and, and feel like their two weeks is, is making a difference. Um, but when you, when you're in it, it's hard to see that, but when you step back and look at the whole picture, um, in the progress, I think that's what I want people to remember is your two weeks is so valuable and you might not be able to see it in the moment, but when you look back, when you travel again, when you talk to somebody else that's traveled there after you, that's when you feel 
that you know you've made the impact. And keep that in mind because those two weeks will challenge you in ways that you never thought possible. You'll be in situations that you never thought up could possibly happen. Um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, your work matters and, um, and it continues to have an impact for, for us, for them. And one day it'll be easier to see. Wow. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate your time and uh, your willingness to share your stories with us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us today on Autism Knows No Borders. I hope you enjoyed listening to Andrew, Brittany, and Jesse describe how going on skill core trips has given them confidence to trust their instinct when handling new or uncertain situations. Just as a reminder, you can find more information about our skill core program at globalautismproject.org. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.